You know, in the mid-90s, the first vehicle I was given to drive was a 78 Pontiac Grand Safari Station Wagon. Now, it did have the big block 400 in it, but the cool factor just did not exist. So I commandeered my dad's 63 Chevy C10 with the 256 cylinder in it and the three on the tree. That was a little better, rotten to the gills. You know, the old pants and tennis shoes would get wet every time it rained. But had a lot of fun in that pickup. But the first car I ever bought for myself, probably at about 16 years old, I got for my oldest brother. It was a 64 Impala 283 Power Glide model. Had a lot of fun and good memories in that car. So early on I developed a very definite soft spot in my heart for the early small displacement small block Chevys. Most guys consider them something to be thrown away, gotten rid of as fast as possible. But you know, for a little bit of money, you can have a whole lot of fun and build a snappy, quick revving engine and not have much in it. And you know, it actually pains me sincerely to see guys just toss those old engines out the door, take them down to the scrapyard, have them chopped up, melted down, whatever. You know, once they're gone, they're gone. And that's another reason why you'll never see me do what I call the Jesse James Hurl when I'm working on something under a hood. You know, these guys that just start pitching air cleaners and car parts over their shoulder. But anyway, if you didn't catch the first video tearing down this early 327, go back and watch that as well. We found a whole lot wrong with it. Somebody treated it like the laundry down by the stream. You know, they were beating it on a rock. But I think we can salvage it without having to spend a whole lot of money down at the machine shop. My only goal here is to save money, have fun, build something that runs strong. You know, maybe something that Smokey Eunuch would be proud of. And then we're going to put it in the second vehicle I've ever owned, this 86 GMC behind me. So let's get started. We've got to clean up a crank, change pistons on rods, camshaft. We've got to get this cleaned up and painted. We got a lot to do. Let's go. You know, expansion plugs or freeze plugs or whatever you guys call them are always one of those things that I put Permatex on. It just takes the guesswork out of the thing. Okay, let's get this thing back on the stand. Got all the block plugs in, and there was so much junk or there had to be so much junk in this floating around in this oil system that I'm just gonna make sure I clean all the oil passages out really well and we will move on to cam bearings Our iron is as clean as I can make it, just been scrubbing it with thinner, rinsing it off with brake clean. Doesn't really matter as long as it gets clean. And now it is time to tape.
Well, I've got everything taped off well enough. Got the holes plugged that I don't want to get paint in. Now I guess it's just time to pretend it's a six-year-old kid down at the pool and I'm its fussy mother. I'm going to be starting with a good coat of engine enamel primer and then I'll move into the alpine green. Got a couple leftover cans of this Alpine Green from the 292 build we did last winter on the uh, 66 C20. If you haven't seen that, go back and check that out. Turned out really well. So let's get to spraying. Come here, sweetie. It's time to reapply. Well, I gave her a good old-fashioned shellacking and turned out really well. Um, that was just one really good coat, no runs. What else would you expect, however? You know, I recently found out that Pour 15 offers a line of engine paints, and I really would like to try them someday, but they don't offer this green that I wanted for this engine. So... Back to the spray paint, but I've never had a problem with it, so it'll be okay. If you've ever tried Pour 15's engine paint, let me know. I'd like to know how that stuff holds up. I would assume very well. I'm going to let this dry for a few minutes, give it a second coat, and call it good for the day. Now that we've got the block looking fresh and fine, we're going to move on into putting stuff back in her. So of course that means we start with the cam bearings. Now cam bearings are one of those things that there's just a whole lot of debate out there. A lot of hurt feelings, a lot of pouting and anger involved. Um, it seems like every resource you go to says something a little bit different. And of course with the internet involved, you're out of luck. You start to trust absolutely nothing. Well, if you have a small block with a smooth journal in it, um, you pretty much have to line the hole in the bearing up with the hole in the journal. There is nothing else you can do. 
hole in the bearing, hole in the top of the journal, you line it up and away you go. But you got to get it perfect. On the groove journals, however, you can play around with it. Now the hot rodders will say put the hole at four degrees because with your valve train, your spring tension, it's pushing that camshaft down at about eight degrees is the center of that tension because of the rotation of the engine and they want an oil wedge getting down as low as they can get to the bottom of that camshaft to keep that thing as oiled and the oil pressure as high as possible in there. The manufacturers from back in the day in the shop manuals they say basically put it back where you got it out you know and that's always a good rule of thumb eat for a just for an average guy doing his own thing in a garage just put the cam bearing back where you got it from makes sense I however I'm gonna put it at two o'clock that's halfway between the oil galley hole the original factory setting and where the high performance guys like it that will help improve our oil wedge and there should be nothing wrong with that and I might add that some bearing manufacturers even say in their instructions on a groove journal it doesn't matter where you put it don't think I agree with that completely but they are professionals I am not you do not need to take my word for it this is not sage advice go to a machine shop and ask what they do that is always a good bet put it back where you found it always a good bet uh, do your own research you might get a little angry you might get a little confused but this is what I do oh and I was also good to add I'm using this cheap um, re removal and install tool specifically for small block Chevys it's a 96470 all-star I really like using this thing because on your professional on your professional tools you're gonna to have a nut here that you tighten and this thing will expand and hold the bearing this just has an o-ring so I can install the bearing I can have my plug on the back side of the engine installed already and I can still drive number five bearing in there and be just fine plus when I get to number one bearing I can pop that off and then I have a three-quarter inch bolt that I cut the threads off of and I can slide that on there and have a a nice little install tool for number one bearing without having this big long handle sticking way out there so that's why I really like using this cheap one on small block Chevy's all right we're gonna start with number five here and since we're upside down my oil hole is actually gonna look like it's in number eight or eight o'clock position I have a line at six o'clock on all the bearings so of course upside down it's gonna look like twelve o'clock
And you'll notice that the number one bearing is very different from the others. It has two holes. Um, and that just goes, or what I do is just put them at 10 and 2. Some, some guys may put one at 12 and one at 4. There again, that's, that's open for debate. Um, I figure there are, all the others are at 2 o'clock, so I put one at 2 and the other where it belongs, and away we go. And I've also been checking them with an Allen wrench, an eighth, in, eighth inch wrench through the hole. Just make sure I'm hitting that oil slot. You can use a small pick, just don't scratch your bearings up. And that is that. Now I kind of loathed the thought of polishing these crank journals. I am very jealous of what material is left on these things. Um, being an original old crank, um, just didn't want to didn't want to get to the point where I had to take it in to get ground. Right now, I think it's okay where it mics out, and we will definitely gauge them uh, once we get it in the mains. And I realize you're not going to remove a ton of material doing this. Um, but anyway, I brought 400 and 800 paper. And I started with 800 and was working on this just really quick. Hit it really quick. And it, it's looking pretty good. I mean, you compare it with the other ones. And yeah, that's going to work just fine. Just want to give the new bearings their best foot forward. So I'm going to do that. And then I'm going to give them a spit polish with Meguiar's medium cut and shine them back up and then we will spray and brush out all the oil passages get all that grit out of there and then hit it with air to make sure we don't have any of that left I will hit the journal for the rear main um, yeah so let's get to it and I would also say that if you have a new crank or one fresh from the machine shop this had better have been done already for you. And here is where I'm going to call it quits. I did end up going back to the rod journals and hitting those with 400. Um, just wasn't happy with how things were progressing with the 800. And so I did that and polished them up. Cleaned everything up. Ran my bore brush. Mm, need to straighten that out. Ran my bore brush through it with brake cleaner. Sprayed everything down blew everything off with air and I think we're ready to go back into the into the block with this thing okay I've got our top half of the mains in you may notice while I'm putting this back together I use bare hands do not use I don't use gloves personal preference but 
I'm just using the sense God gave me, my finger sense, to tell if I have dirt and crud anywhere. So I'm constantly feeling these and I have wiped, um, just sprayed some penetrating oil on a cloth and I wiped it in there by hand. I just don't like putting things together dry even though I'm uh, plastic aging here. Alrighty. Nice and slow here. All right. A lot of grease in that back end. Ooh. You know, plastic gauging bearings is one of those tasks that takes them back to being a kid. As a young feller, there wasn't a whole lot a guy could do to help his dad in rebuilding an engine. But plastic gauging seemed almost absurdly simple to do something very important. Torque these to sixty five. All right, well, I was a little apprehensive of what I would find out when it came to plastic gauging the crank because this thing is old and used and has never been turned down. Um, but three of our journals are actually at two thousands, like this one here, and then two of them, two and four, are actually a little bit wider one and a half thousandths maybe four is actually smaller it's in between two and one and a half so that's you you know good rule of thumb is between one and three thousandths and we are right in there so I'm saying we're good to go so I'm gonna clean all the plastic off and pop this back out, start putting assembly lube on the bearings, and we'll tighten it down for real this time. Okay, now they want you to go 10 to 20 foot-pounds on the rear. A lot of torque wrenches aren't even going to go that low. That's 20. That'll be fine. I'm going to take my largest dead blow and smack the front end of the crank. 
line that thrust bearing up, smack it forward. And then we can go back up to our 60 to 70. Got way ahead of myself there. There we go. And there we go. That rear main is as good as we can make it. We spin nice and free. I guess it's on to work on the pistons. Well, we're really getting to the fun stuff now. It's time to push these old pins out so I can change out our pistons. So I've got my special tools here. Other people may call it a piece of pipe with a bolt welded in it and a piece of square tubing with two little castellations or I don't know what you'd call it. But that's it. Oh, and my 100 year old press. Can't forget that. Oh, and two things I guess I failed to mention. Make sure your rod is marked what went to the front of the engine, just like the piston, so you can get it back in the same position. I mentioned it in the first video, but also make sure your rod and cap are numbered before you remove them. Now I'm going to pop the bearings out, go clean this up, put it in line on the table, and move on to the next. All right, I've got one more to go, just laying them out, cleaning them up. I've punch marked the fronts on all of them, but the next step I kind of need to know what's front really quickly, so I've come back with a paint marker and just numbered them on the front side of every single one so I can identify front immediately. So I'll get that out and then we will move on to the next step. Well, I'll just show you the operation I've got going on here. Got all the pistons pressed off. Um, I'm not going to get too fussy about balancing on this engine. I don't think it's that big of an issue to be honest with you. Now these pistons were a match set. Um, I weighed them all, the digital scale. Four of them were 26.53 ounces and the other four 0.49 ounces so I just kinda well I weighed my connecting rods and I just kind of arranged the pistons by weight so that I'd get the most advantage as far as balancing goes now I mean you can you can remove material and make them all 0.49 if you want um, my lightest connecting rods were 0.46, or uh, excuse me, 19.93 ounces. The heaviest, 20.04. You know, you're talking about tenths of an ounce, or excuse me, hundredths of an ounce. Um, and I've got them arranged so, you know, it's as balanced as it's going to get. Now I'm going to show you the setup real quick. Um, what I'm going to do here, now I do have a rod heater or rod oven available to me, but it's a couple hours away and it's going to be several weeks at least before I head that direction, um, at least that I know of. You never can tell with the way things go um, in my life, but um, I wanted to progress. So my bride was already at Wally World, so I had her pick up a toaster oven. Um, you can get them for half the price than this Black & Decker, um, but 
it only goes to 350 and I really wanted 400 450 range I do not want to use a torch um, my very soul really rebels against that because it would be so easy to overdo it without trying to and you just don't get a uniform heat now obviously a rod oven is only going to heat the end you need to heat and I'm doing the whole thing but that's not going to matter in my opinion and a guy can run to you know a thrift shop or a garage sale and find one of these probably just a couple bucks um, you wouldn't have to spend a whole lot of money there and then inside the old international harvester that I usually don't keep plugged in because I don't need to be running it the whole time I've got my pins nice and frosty plug that in earlier so I've got a bit of a run to get to there a um, little farther than I would like but uh, we'll deal with it and guys I know you're thinking well there's a room in our house that has an oven and a freezer and a whole acre of counter space a guy could work on and all I'd have to do is wait till the the little lady went to bingo or the coffee shop to meet her friends just don't even go there guys we both know how that's gonna end just admit it you know no matter how clean you're gonna try to be you know how it's gonna end by the time she comes home every window in the house is gonna be open and every fan you have is gonna be trying to move the aura of hot Quaker state out of the house and you are going to be reminded constantly for months every time you smell the bedspreads and the curtains and the carpet that hot 30 weight you know it's just gonna come back to haunt you you know just don't go there do you want your peach cobbler tasting like AMS oil do you so my best advice to you if you want to do this method get a cheap oven a toaster oven um, borrow or beg a rod oven or better yet take them all to a machine shop and just have them done uh, and the reality is back in the day when this engine was new they pressed the pins out pressed them back in and away they went they didn't worry about monkeying around with all this stuff about heating rods and freezing pins um, not that I don't think it is beneficial and if you don't have a fridge in your shop you know they can be clean you know put them in the house freezer take them out on ice better yet get dry ice from the supermarket and just keep them right on your bench nice and frozen for when you need them this is going to be kind of a juggling act how I'm going to do this but we'll see if it works my piston here in this homemade vise I've got forward that way I know which is forward on my rod because it's I marked it so I know that will go that way everything is ready I'm just waiting on these rods to get hot I don't know if that's too accurate doing it through the glass there but and sure this method is going to take a little bit longer but who cares there's just absolute garbage on TV and the news is nothing but lies We're getting close to 400. I think I'm gonna try it. Okay, that worked great. The only thing is, for some reason, my stop got a little moved. So when I center the pin or the rod there, it's about flush on this side, about an eighth of an inch on this side. Well, that's no big deal. I can simply press a sixteenth of an inch on the press on this one. But my stop, I'm going to move it a sixteenth of an inch to the left here and that should solve that problem 
Let's try another one. Check this about in the center. Sticking about about sixteenth of an inch on each side. I love it when a plan comes together. Okay, that went very well. Didn't beat up anything. Everything's nice and centered, nice and tight. Should work just fine. Hopefully I even have the, all the fronts towards the front. Anyway, time to put rings on. We will take these back to the shop at work. Rings, install them in the block. Let's go do it. Okay, I've got my piston rings laid out over there on the cart and I want to check our ring gap since this is a very undetermined cylinder size I mean you know what I mean we know what size it is but we want to double check we're we're gonna be okay here so I'm gonna square that ring in the bore like so and I want I'm looking for 10 to 20 thousands gap here 20 does not go in I'm betting 10 will 10 squeaks in there let's go to 12 12 does let's go to 15 15 Not really. Doesn't really matter at this point. 14 does, 15 does not. So we're right in the middle of the range we're looking for, which is great. Which is great. Um, and I measured all the cylinders. I know they are all um, within one thousandths of each other. Excellent news. It's probably a great idea to go through, check every ring. I'm pretty sure they're going to be very consistent and we have a lot of room to play there so I'm not going to worry about it too much also great idea to make sure these go in check the fit with a feeler gauge check your specs on that roll them around make sure they're going to work okay for your pistons went around checking ring gaps on the compression rings everything was incredibly consistent right around 14 15 thousandths which is perfect your oil rings are going to even have a greater tolerance so I've got my expander in there I'm going to roll my bottom oil ring on line the gap in the expander with the pin and I'm just gonna offset the bottom to the left an inch offset the the top to the right an inch good to go no fuss no muss number two ring is a chamfered ring So it is marked on top, got to make sure you get that top where it belongs. Number one, 
the profile is square cut you can put it on either way get in there all right just for fun we're going to check this ring in the land here one and a half thousandths two thousandths doesn't go in two thousandths does not go in one and a half starts to so that's good I'm not going to worry about our orientation right now because everything will change and once once you turn the, the crank the rings are going to move anyway but uh, we'll make an effort to get them opposite of each other when we put them in Okay, I believe we're ready to go. I have all the rings on, all the bearings in. I have put assembly lube on the top half. I'm not going to drive the run the pistons back out just to put lube on later on the top half. So that's why I do that. Got a little pan of motor oil just lubricate my rings with. I will have to adjust my ring compressor a little bit, I'm sure. Well, I'll tell you what, when I built that 292 just a little while ago, that was the first time I'd used this style of ring compressor, and it worked magnificently. I did not have a bit of a problem. But this thing fought it the entire time. Um, if I'm going to keep going today, um, I may have another style in the toolbox over here that's big enough, I'll have to check. But otherwise, I'm going to have to struggle on with this thing fun fun well I found one and it works a little better so that's what I'm gonna proceed with let's get these in there
please excuse all the wind noise if you can hear it. We have something like sustained 50 mile an hour winds outside right now and 70 mile an hour gusts possible all day long. You know, another Kansas day. So the Pistons were just a fight. I'm talking Rocky meets that Russian on steroids fight. I found this one and the little the little latch mechanism is kind of stripped out. This thing's so old. So I had to hold tension on it while trying to get the piston in. The rod lined up. It was a mess. Um, but anyway, we were successful, so why am I complaining? Now I've already plastigaged these two rear rods. They are at two thousandths all day long, so they are perfect. Those two you would want about one to three thousandths. I didn't show you earlier, but my thrust bearing, oh that's lovely. My thrust bearing here between the crank and the, uh, the bearing, what was it at? I kind of forget already. If it was like four, there's three, three just, <clears throat> three just barely goes in there. So we're good there, and then you can check the end play on the rods between in the crank journals. Um, I forget what I had. There's nine. It goes in there, but it's kind of snug. Ten. Ten goes in there a little harder. So anyway, that's plenty good. Check your check your specs if you're doing a project. But I'm going to clean this up and I'm going to keep plastic aging rod bearings. Um, so yeah, let's do that. Well, we ended up with rod bearings that were incredibly consistent all the way down the line. Two thousandths on every single one, and that really shouldn't be surprising because on the previous video, we miked all the journals and they were consistent all down the line. New bearings, so makes sense. Um, I think the last thing I will do with you on this one is I'm going to tear down that 305 to the point of the camshaft and get that in here and the timing set on here and then that should do it
Okay, our brand new Edelbrock camshaft is in place that we stripped the 305 down for. Um, pretty much everything I need off of there for this build I've got off and we'll just throw that in storage somewhere. Next thing is I need to press the or uh, <laughs> install the bottom gear. Normally I would have liked to have done that with the crankshaft out. Um, don't I don't like pressing or knocking things against that thrust bearing out the other end of the crankshaft. But I brought my Easy Bake Oven to work with me this morning. I'm heating that up. We're going to expand that and that'll go on nice and easy on the crank snout there. I'll get the timing set on and I or a thread lock on the cam bolts. One one piece of good news, I wasn't sure if when I put that new camshaft in the 305, if I got new lifters along with it. And absolutely, these have never been run. You can just tell by looking at them. So that's good. New lifters from Edelbrock ready to go in the 327. Well guys, this is where I'm going to leave you. Got the timing set on. Um, gear went on very easy when it was nice and hot dual roller chain nice and tight brand new set number one is at top dead center timing marks lined up thread lock on the bolts very important you do that let me show you why when I opened up the 305 for the first time I don't think it had ever been before one of the cam gear bolts was completely loose and was machining that groove inside the cover there so be sure you get those glued on. I'm not quite sure where I'm going to take you on the next video. It's either going to be involving cylinder heads or other parts of the engine. I've got this 67, 68 uh, factory manifold that would have been on the 327s, 350s. Probably going to use that because it has the quadrajet style uh, top on it. And I could do a quadrajet. I do have a 4GC four barrel intake and carburetor. That would be an old school option. But I do have the Edelbrock Performer carburetor that I was planning on going on here. So I've got several options. Leave a comment. If you have something in specific, I mean, if you have an opinion, don't be afraid to shoot it down there. I'll read it doesn't mean I'm going to do it, but I'll read it. Um, oil pan, the valve covers. What I want to do is make something like the old school Chevy script valve covers where there were no oil caps or breathers or anything on them. So I'm going to take two of these old 70s or 80s valve covers weld shut the holes, take the baffles off the bottom side. I will probably cut on one I will remove these wire loom brackets and one I will keep them. Um, then I'll get some kind of decal or do something that shows it's GMC. I don't think I'm gonna put those heater decals back on that just didn't stick too well. But we'll come up with something interesting. As far as cylinder heads, I'm going to leave these with this block. Nothing special. Those are the 53 or 58 cc's with the 172 intakes. Typical smog era stuff. I've got an entire pallet from that Chevy engine hoard. That pallet is all the same kind of stuff, either very small combustion chambers or very large. So 50s or 70 or 76 cc you know and all 172 intake valves except for the orange ones on the left side those have uh, 202 intake valves those would be the only two on that pallet I would be interested in using except I think that's overkill for what I'm trying to do and in my opinion you're opening yourself up for burning valves because you just don't have that much of a heat sink in there. This pallet I've got six or eight old school heads. None of them are very exciting. At least five of them or are um, 
265 heads, all 172 intake, small combustion chambers, but 172 intakes. Here's the intake manifold with a 4GC on it. Not sure, not sure. Then at home I looked through what I had. I've got an engine that I thought was a 305 in a 63 C10. If you've seen my videos where I'm kind of outside where I park little cars, it's in that orange 63 pickup. That has, I forget the casting number off the top of my head, is it 416, the last three digits? Um, I think they're 70 or 76 cc combustion chambers, but they're either 184s or 194 intakes. Still don't like that combustion chamber size. I'm looking for 60 or 64 cc, 184, 194 intake valves. Um, and all of these from the 70s or 80s, I'm not too interested anyway because they are thinner castings, cheaper, you know, lighter weight castings. Not that that's a big deal. There's a million cars still running around with them, um, and this isn't going to be super high performance. But still, if I'm going through all the trouble, I want something halfway decent on them. So then I was really leaning forward to um, I have some power pack heads from the mid 60s that would have been on 283s and 327s. They'd be 60 cc combustion chamber but still only the 172 intake valves. Uh, I was considering grinding out the intakes for 184s, but there is a chance that good old Kevin in Wisconsin... I might as well take them if you... Okay, yeah. Uh, I'm just going to take anything you offer, you know. He contacted me, knew where some double hump heads were um, that would go right on this engine, be period correct. I can deal with the accessory brackets, I believe. Shouldn't be do too difficult because they won't have the accessory uh, threaded holes in them. So we'll just see. It's going to be a surprise to me. But I'm thinking for now, I'm either going to go with the power pack heads that I have, maybe do something with the intakes, maybe not, or we get our hands on some double hump heads, which would be perfect exactly what we want some guys may think oh throw a set of vortex heads on here they're exactly that size um, again I want to use my old school intake old school valve covers and if I go to vortex heads that just ruins the entire look so I'm gonna do what I want to do so for now I say thank you thanks for joining me God bless you guys. I hope you've had a little bit of fun watching this. I know it was a long one. I'm going to shut up now because I don't like talking anyway. And we will see you on the next one. Bye. Finally got one of these Apple watches. Works pretty good.